So up until now, we have, um, oh, wow. How'd that happen? Okay, we have put the food in our mouth, we have chewed it up with our teeth, moved it around with the tongue, mixed it with saliva. We learned that we had two enzymes in our saliva. One was active immediately and then inactivated in the acid of the stomach, and that was the salivary amylase, the one that worked on sugars. And then the lipase, the one that worked on fats, was also secreted in the mouth, but was not active until it got to the acid of the stomach, right? Um, and then we pushed all that food down through the esophagus. Yeah, we talked about how it moves through there. We talked about the process of swallowing or deglutition. And then when we did the esophagus, we talked about the lower esophageal sphincter, the one, that little gate that controls the um, food as it moves into the esophagus. But the main objective of that esophageal sphincter was to stop the acid from the stomach coming in. So it only opens up when there's food there ready to go down, and then it closes back up again to stop that acid from coming up. So let's talk about the stomach. The stomach is... Um, Part of that GI tract, it has the ability to distend and hold a large amount of food. Um, we've already seen the stomach on the cat. You guys remember that? Okay, so that this is where we should start remembering some of the stuff that we tried to block out from test three. Um, parts of the stomach, the part where the esophagus comes into the stomach right here, that is called the cardia. That's one of the things we didn't talk about in lab. The other parts of the stomach, this top part that arches up here, that is the fundus of the stomach. You've got the main body. The last part of the stomach is the pylorus. And one of the things that we didn't get to see in lab was the pyloric sphincter, which is right there. The pyloric sphincter is the part that's going to control the emptying of the stomach into the small intestine. And that first part of small intestine is the duodenum, right? Okay. So... Food comes down through the esophagus, goes into the stomach. Stomach holds it, also throws a lot of acid on it and um, some more digestive juices and enzymes, and then mixes it all up. So uh, one of the important parts of the stomach is the muscle layers. Remember you had your um, mucosa, <coughs> submucosa, and then your muscularis. The muscularis layer in the stomach actually has three layers of muscle. The um, outermost is longitudinal, right here. This is your longitudinal layer. It goes the length of the stomach. Below that, you're going to have a circular layer that goes around the stomach, and then an inner oblique layer, which is going to be diagonal. So those are the three layers of muscularis in all different directions. You have one going straight back and forth. You have one in a circle and one oblique. So all three of those should be able to mix and turn all of that food that you just took into your stomach. Um, another important feature of the stomach is on the inside. Remember the rugae, those folds that we could see, right? Because that was on the test. I had some people get that wrong, y'all. Like how, how? Okay. Rugae, remember at the time I said, well, rugae is kind of like if you took a balloon and you deflated it and crunched it up, it would be all wrinkly on the surface, but it still has the ability to distend. That's why the stomach has rugae, because it has that excess tissue where if it needs to expand and take in a large meal, it can do that. And the more you eat or fill that stomach up, the smaller and smaller those rugae get. So if you fully, completely distend a stomach, you won't have any rugae on the inside. They will actually even out and, and flatten out, which I think is a cool feature. Okay, we also have two curvatures on the stomach. This top one here was the lesser curvature, and then the larger, inferior, greater curvature down there. I forgot that I had a little remote. So I have some awesome news. Well, not for you guys, because you're already in AMP2, but for, 
for, um, sorry if you were allowed to meet to hear this again, but for, um, for maybe your siblings or friends or whatever, guess who gets to teach AMP one and two online? Yep, finally happened. Yay! I feel like I deserve a statue just for getting that. Um, next in the fall, I in the fall I'm teaching online A and P one, and then I'm teaching in class A and P one, and I might have one lecture. There's very few A P two lectures in the fall, and then it reverses. Then in the spring I'll teach A and P two online and on campus, and um, I may have taken, I'm actually still working on that schedule, but I may take one a and one lecture. Take what? Um, I asked one of my students yesterday to open a GoFundMe for me. So if they do, if you all manage to get a GoFundMe up and get it running, I mean, y'all, I've got sob stories forever, but if you get a GoFundMe going and it actually fills up, I'll totally teach micro over the summer. If not, then I'm getting a bartending job over the summer. That's what it is. All right, so um, looking at the stomach, this is a real specimen here. Again, you've got the esophagus bringing everything in. Remember, you have sphincters here controlling into the stomach. Your lesser curvature, your greater curvature. This is your cardia, your fundus, body, and then your pylorus. And you do have a, this is a really good image right here showing you that pyloric sphincter. It's actually pretty cool. So you can see how it closes and only, and what's cool about that pyloric sphincter is, so the stomach takes in all of this food that you've swallowed and then mixes it with this acid and it just keeps mixing and mixing and mixing. And then it only gives the duodenum just little bits at a time. It never puts it all in there because the small intestine doesn't have the ability that the stomach does to actually expand. Like if you were to see your stomach when it's empty, it's like, it's not very big at all. It's almost like the size of like a really large sausage. Or um, you guys know what that summer sausage, have you ever seen summer sausage? It would be like a piece of, like a chunk of summer sausage is what it looks like. It's that small, but it has the ability to get really, really big. Okay, so what does the stomach do? What's the functions? Well. It takes the food and saliva that you swallowed, adds gastric juice to it, mixes it all together, and when it does that, it becomes something called chyme. So chyme is the stuff you swallowed mixed with the gastric juice of the stomach. It also serves as a reservoir. What's a reservoir? Like a holding tank for all of the food and drink, everything you've ingested until it's time to go into the duodenum. The stomach itself does secrete gastric juice, and gastric juice is mainly hydrochloric acid along with some hormones and um, enzymes, like pepsin is an enzyme, intrinsic factor, and gastric lipase. Don't freak out because we will actually discuss those in a little more detail. And gastrin is your hormone there into the blood. So we've got Gastric juice being produced by the stomach, a lot of hydrochloric acid in it, some enzymes, and it has a hormone called um, gastrin that it's going to secrete into our bloodstream. It's going to mix and mix and mix, producing uh, or creating chyme out of the food and drinks that we've swallowed, and then it's going to hold on to it until it's time to uh, put it into the duodenum. Mixy, mixy, mixy. Y'all, our volleyball team um, is going on to uh, nationals. Super cool. If you know somebody in volleyball, make sure you congratulate them. Our girls' team's awesome. All right. Histologically, the stomach. We already know that there's a mucosa, a submucosa, and a muscularis, right? Let's talk about the mucosa. Remember how we had gastric pits microscopically, and I showed them to you in lab, and I said, we're going to talk about those in lecture because there are cells in those gastric pits that have important jobs. Yes, maybe. Okay, and that's what we're going to do. So 
our layers, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis. Remember your muscularis had how many layers to it or directions? Three, right, three. Your serosa, that would be, or part of your serosa is going to be your visceral peritoneum, right? Remember, this is the first time we are seeing serosa because peritoneum, in the esophagus, it was adventitia. Are y'all awake? I am speaking legibly, clearly. Okay. Um, so we're going to focus on these gastric pits and what's going on in them. But just to kind of recap, you had your submucosa, that's your connective tissue, your blood vessels, your nerves traveling through there. And then your muscularis was that thick muscle layer that caused the movement. And then on the outside, your protection was your serosa. Okay. Gastric glands are inside of those gastric pits. We call them glands because these are the cells that secrete the stuff that eventually becomes that gastric juice. Does everybody know where I am right now? In the mucosa. All right. I didn't write these down because they're already here, but this is one of those examples where you have a picture, but don't overlook it because it has important information on it. Okay. So let's talk about the cells of these gastric glands, which are found in the gastric pits. This is a gastric pit right here. Okay. On the surface, the majority of these guys up here are surface mucus cells. And just like their name says, surface mucus cell, they secrete mucus. Um, coming in here, when you start dropping into this pit, you're going to see some mucus neck cells. Again, mucus neck cells secrete mucus. So if it has mucus in the name, it secretes mucus. Okay. Now, when we get down into the, uh, the dark parts of this pit, that's where the seriousness comes out, right? Everything gets scarier and more difficult as you go down deeper into the darkness. So we have parietal cells. Parietal cells are the big guys that are secreting our hydrochloric acid and also intrinsic factor. Our chief cells, chief cells are the ones that are going to secrete these enzymes, gastric li lipase and pepsinogen. Our G cells at the very bottom, it even looks like a monster. Our G cells are the ones that secrete the gastrin hormone. G, gastrin. G cell, gastrin. And don't freak out just yet because um, we will talk about that hormone at the very end. And the enzymes, we're going to talk about them in general. So I should be able to say, okay, I have mucus, mucus coming from my mucus cells, whether they're surface or mucus neck cells. They all secrete mucus. I have my hydrochloric acid coming from the parietal cell. And then I have enzymes like uh, gastric lipase coming from my chief cell. And then I have a hormone, which is my gastrin, coming from the G cell. Huh? Yeah. What are you guys write? Everyone type me. All right. Um. I debated whether to take this out or leave it in. I really did because um, there's a lot going on here. And this is really showing you just in that uh, cell that creates the hydrochloric acid. What cell is that? Do you remember? Parietal cell. In the parietal cell of that gastric gland, what's going on? What happens to create hydrochloric acid and dump it into the inside of the stomach? Um, there's a lot of detail in this slide that you don't, you don't need to have. I just kind of wanted you to get an overview of what's going on. So don't freak out about this one too much just yet. Um, and if it helps your eyes to look on the right side, you can do that. Or I just want to talk about one thing over here. Okay. Because it's a matter of, this is all chemistry. It's an exchange of ions. And it happens through something, or it starts through something called a proton pump. So this is your main player, your proton pump. You have 
um, a series of reactions happening here with enzymes that will also require ATP. Bottom line, um, it's going to give you hydrochloric acid on the inside. This is the inside of the stomach here. And every time this parietal cell produces a molecule of hydrochloric acid to the inside, it is going to put a HCO3, which is a bicarbonate, into the blood side. So as your stomach gets more and more acidic, your blood becomes more and more alkalinic. And that was all I really wanted you to take from this because that will explain um, a lot of things that change in a person's body after a large meal, right? Or a lot, like you ever go and have like a huge, like I, it happens to me every time I go to Cracker Barrel, which I don't do very often, but I, I love to do. Um, so if I get like, you know, or go to, Waffle House and have the pancakes, the hamburger, and um, the biscuits or whatever you eat all at once, right? Do you not get tired, y'all? Are you sleepy? You're a little drowsy? You can't focus? You have so much um, alkalinity in your blood flow or your bloodstream at that time, and it's because it's having to exchange protons to produce that hydrochloric acid for your stomach to be able to digest. So I just left that in there because it's a little kind of cool fact of, oh, by the way, you know, next time you get sleepy or dizzy or uh, fuzzy headed after a large meal, it's because of that alkaline tide. It's all at once being thrown at you. Okay. And then here, this does bring into mind though what gastrin does, by the way. Gastrin is that um, hormone that's going to control the production of hydrochloric. Cool. Nobody cares. Okay, awesome. And then we go into a summary of the stomach, the cells, and what they do. I'll leave that on there if you care to read it. And that will end that PowerPoint. We can move right on to da -da -da -da, the next one. So, um, There's a lot of material to cover in this unit. <laughs> but we're gonna do it. Oh wait. So I don't want you guys to fall behind and I don't want you to feel like something is confusing you. I think the most important thing when it comes to the digestive system is to understand um, the organs and you know what those cells do. Which cells do what? Um, oh, man, we didn't talk about antacids. Y'all want to talk about antacids? Do you really, though? Um, no, it doesn't feel right. I don't know. Okay. okay. No, it's just I always push, like, okay, so my, see, you know how to get me started. My boys are always <laughs> eating, like, the worst um, levels of spiciness you've ever heard of yeah like my child is the child that will go to a thai restaurant and be like no i want it thai hot and some extra hot stuff on the side too yeah and so <laughs> yeah like my son made pasta last night and i was sitting in bed and i could hear him finishing it and i'm like do i want some but i know it's going to be so spicy that i can't eat it but I went and got some anyways and just like tortured myself with it because it's so good, but it's so spicy, I can't handle it. Yeah. So anyways, let's talk about, um, well, we talked about acid reflux when we talked about the esophagus, right? How the acid bubbles up. We didn't talk about taking an antacid at all? Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. So we did talk about it. Good. See, we did. All right. Okay. So we can go right on to the next part of our digestive system. So we swallowed it in the mouth, chewed it up, swallowed it, went down the esophagus, went into the stomach. It got turned and mixed with a lot of gastric juice, which was a lot of hydrochloric acid. And now it's ready to move on to the small intestines. And the small intestines, believe it or not, are the big players in our digestive system. And the reason is most of the absorption that's going to happen is going to happen in the small intestines. Pretty cool. Majority 
of digestion and absorption is going to happen in the small intestines. What does digestion digest digestion mean? What does that mean? To break down, right? Breaking down things into smaller pieces. So we're going to break down everything into small pieces. Absorption is when we take it into our bloodstream, right? Absorb it into our body. So all most of it it's going to happen in the small intestines. So they have a huge job, a lot of length, three parts to the small intestine. The duodenum is the first part. That's right after the stomach. The second part is the jejunum, my middle child. The very last part is the ileum. And the ileum will empty into the large intestine. Just like every other part of our digestive, or actually the GI tract, there is a sphincter at the opening and a sphincter or valve, some kind of checkpoint at the end. The pyloric sphincter is what controls contents going from the stomach to the duodenum. The ileocecal valve is what controls contents leaving the ileum going into the cecum. So with those two checkpoints, I can control what's coming in and I can also control how long it stays in this intestine so that everything can be absorbed that needs to be absorbed. Okay, that's just basic anatomy of the small intestines. Functions of the small intestine. What does it do? Well, it is going to mix. It's going to mix the chyme. What was chyme? Coming from the stomach. Right, when you mix the food with the saliva, with the gastric juice, it becomes chyme. And that happens in the stomach. So... Mixing of that chyme with the digestive juices, these are coming from the intestine, right? So these are intestinal, intus, wait, intus, you get it, from the intestine, <laughs> the digestive juices, and expose it to the mucosa for absorption. So I've mixed, I've absorbed, and... Um, I'm going to complete digestion of everything, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and even some nucleic acids. So it's super cool. 90% of my nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. 90% nutrients and water are absorbed in the small intestine. Yeah. So there you go, that's a, that's a way to kill someone um, very slowly. Remove the small intestines, they'll die of starvation, but it'll take a long time. <laughs> Me and my ideas, <laughs> just saying. Okay, <clears throat> so big job here, it's mixing, it's absorb, it's digesting, absorbing, lots of stuff going on, okay. Histologically, we have mucosa, we have submucosa, and we have a muscularis. So muscularis is pretty standard, nothing special. We'll talk about the movements that happen by it. The mucosa, we have different types of cells, and yes, we are going to break them down, but we have absorptive cells. We have, um, what do you think they do? Absorptive cells, what do they do? They absorb, right? Absorb your nutrients. What do you think goblet cells do? Mucus. Interior endocrine and panic, these are going to be your enzymes and your hormones. And then your pyre patches will be your lymphatic uh, portion. And we already know that, right? Yes? Okay. In the submucosa, I should have put, I'm sorry, I should have put that over here. How did I not? Um, okay. So over here under mucosa, it has MALT. MALT stands for mucosal associated lymphatic tissue. Okay. Um, so there are patches, but Pyre's patches is found in the submucosa, obviously, but it is associated with the mu mucosa, which is why it was up there. And then we also have Bruner's glands and the duodenum. What do they do? To create mucus, right? So there's a lot of mucus coming out. Because everything coming from the stomach is hyperacidic. Yes, right? So it leaves the stomach, goes into the wadum, bam, we got Bruner's glands. 
right? We got goblet cells. Not only that, but we have bile coming in there, which will help neutralize the acid. We have pancreatic secretions coming out there, which will also help neutralize the acid. So there's a lot of mechanisms in place to neutralize all the stuff that's coming from the stomach into the small intestine. So um, microscopically, mucosa, submucosa, whoops. We also have uh, villi, right? And we're going to talk about microvilli in a minute. So my cells, my absorptive cell, yes, digest and absorb. My goblet cell, mucus. My interior endocrine cell is secreting secretin and cholecystokinin. My panic cell is secreting enzymes like lysozyme and also phagocytose. And don't worry about the hormones because we are going to talk about the hormones um, at the very, very end because I put them all on one page. Okay, so I have, did I talk about surface area? No, I didn't talk about surface area yet. Okay, so I have these small intestines that are meant to do most of my digestion and 90% of that absorption, right? So I have to make sure I can get as much surface area as possible so these absorptive cells can absorb everything they have to absorb. So not only do we have villi, right, that increase, because if it's a straight line, I can maybe get 10 cells on it, but if I pop it up and down, I can now get 300 cells in that area. So we have villi, but those cells themselves, those absorptive cells that are on those villi, actually have microvilli. So they have little borders on their tops that allow them to increase their absorptive surface area. So here's my villi, right? You see your villi? Now, if I take a little chunk of this, just a tiny little piece and blow it up, I can see microvilli on top of the cells. These are actually just two little cells here. There's one cell there and one cell there. So these microvilli will increase that surface area of that absorptive cell, allowing it to absorb even more stuff. And over here, you've got a nice example of those uh, mucosal lymphatic tissues, those Peyer's patches. Okay. That was microscopically. Now, macroscopically, if I take a piece of a small intestine out and I look at it, I also have folds in that um, inside of that lumen, just like the stomach had rugae, the small intestines have circular folds. So that's what you're seeing here. And then if I got in closer with a microscope, I'll be able to see villi. And if I increase the magnification of that microscope, I'll see microvilli on each individual cell. Does that make sense? So circular folds, you can see with your eyes. Villi, you're, you'll see with a microscope. And microvilli, you'll see with a higher magnification on a microscope. So all of these three things, circular folds, villi, and microvilli, these are all there in order to increase the area that we can absorb in. It's increasing surface area of the small intestine. You guys are writing so fast and trying to go slow. Okay. So I've got the surface area. Do I have the juice that's going to help break down all that stuff? I sure do. I have antistinal juice, which is, which is going to help me absorb all those substances from that chyme. And I also, I also have brush border enzymes. Whenever you see brush border, we're talking about those little cells that have the microvilli. They actually have enzymes on their surface, on the outside of the cell. And what's cool about those brush border enzymes is that they can break things down before it's even absorbed into the cell, right? Because if the enzyme's inside the cell, I have to take in the substance, break it down, then put it into the bloodstream. But if I have enzymes on the outside of my door, I can break them down before I even bring them in, right? Yeah. Okay.
So my mechanical digestion that's happening, remember mechanical is all about moving things or mixing things. Mechanical digestion in the small intestine, I'm going to have two types of movement. I'll have segmentation and peristalsis. Segmentation is super cool. Segmentation is where you have, imagine if this was like a uh, piece of intestine right here, okay? And that chyme just came in from the stomach. So I can contract on this end, it's going to push it that way. If I contract here, it pushes it back that way. If I keep alternating these contractions, this food is going back and forth, the same type of motion that you would like shake a bottle of something or um, a milkshake or chocolate milk. Chocolate milk. I can't think of anything you shake. Chocolate milk, right? You have it, you shake it back and forth. That's that mixing action that happens with segmentation. And then peristalsis is going to be a more movement type of contraction, exactly the same as or very similar to what we saw in the esophagus, where it was just kind of um, contracting and then relaxing to allow it to move forward. That's what peristalsis does. It, it slowly moves the stuff kind of like a, a worm. If you've ever seen an earthworm go, you know, contract the neck. Yeah, moving it down. So that is peristalsis. And again, all of the muscle movement that's happening in smooth muscle in the GIT is going to happen with the myenteric plexus. Remember that? What was the plexus that controlled the secretions? It started with an S because secretion starts with an S. Submucosal, the submucosal plexus. Yeah. <laughs> My enteric was muscle, right? And submucosal, yeah, submucosal was secretions. Y'all better keep up with it. Don't let it, do not let it pile up on you, I promise. Don't do it. Please, please keep up with it. Okay, so that's mechanical. We have mixing with segmentation. We have movement with peristalsis that helps move it down the line. All of that is done by the myenteric plexus. What about chemically? What's going on? Well, chemically, we're basically digesting everything, right? And in order to digest most, most, most things, they have to be broken down into a very simple form in order to cross those borders and get into our bloodstream. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to break down carbohydrates with pancreatic amylase. That is a uh, hormone coming, I mean, sorry, an enzyme coming out of the pancreas. Sucrose, lactase, maltase. It's a pretty good guess that if you see the ending of A-S-E after a word, an A's, it's going to be an enzyme. And a lot of times they've been really kind naming these enzymes and they just kind of name it after what it breaks down. So if I had to guess, maltase would be breaking down maltose. Lactase would be breaking down lactose. Make sense? Okay. Um, proteins are going to be broken down with things like trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase, aminopeptidase. Again, the ending is ASE. The, the beginning part will tell you what it's breaking down. And then my lipids, I have lipases. Pancreatic lipase, what else? I had other lipases. I had a lipase that started up here and was activated in the stomach. Lingual lipase. Yeah. So any lipase is going to break down a fat. And then I have enzymes to break down nucleic acids too, like ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease. These are just examples of some of the enzymes. There are more. They're all in a chart at the very end when you get to the summaries. They're all there. Okay, I just put a few of them. But at any given moment, you should be able to see something like lactase or maltase and say, okay, that breaks down sugar. Or um, a trypsin, a peptidase, any peptidase. Remember, your proteins are held together how? With peptide bonds. Amino acids are held together with peptide bonds. So any peptidase is going to break a protein. Um, any lipase. It's going to break apart a fat, a lipid, right? That's the basics that you need to know. So I'm not saying you have to memorize every single enzyme out there, no. But be able to recognize, is this a lipase or is it a peptidase? 
right? So we can at least recognize what it's trying to do. Um, and then your nucleic acids are super easy because ribonuclease, deibo, deoxyribonuclease, obviously RNA and DNA, right? Okay. Y'all tell me if I go over your head because I don't want to be those. I don't want to be the professor that does like oh, duh, but then it's something we've never talked about. And you're like, what is she talking about? But nobody wants to say anything. I would be the one student. Y'all should have been in school with me. I would be the one student like, that doesn't make any sense. And no, you've never talked about that before. Can you just say it again, please? Because I don't remember that. That would be me, for real. Okay, so it's all of those ases, all of the enzymes that are breaking things down, digesting them. Now that we've broken them down into simpler forms, we have to absorb them in order to benefit from them. So they're going to be absorbed through those um, cells of the small intestine and then go into the bloodstream. It does differ on what it is. It will differ how it's absorbed. But let's talk about, I actually wrote down some of the basics for you, and here is a picture showing you all of that. So your carbohydrates, all of your sugars, have to be broken down into the simplest form. They have to be monosaccharides in order to be absorbed. Okay? So any complex carbohydrate, any disaccharide, any polysaccharide has to be a monosaccharide in order to be absorbed into your body. And I wrote that down right here. Must be monosaccharides. Once they are in monosaccharide form, they can cross right over the cell, um, either with an active transport or facilitated diffusion, and then go right into your blood. This is the blood on the right side here. Proteins. Most of our proteins are going to be broken down into amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. If you get them to amino acid form, it's pretty easy after that to absorb them. And then, so we break them down into amino acids, then we can active transport them in through the cell and diffuse them into the blood. Coincidentally, most of those proteins, or about half of the proteins that we take back into our body are actually coming from our own body. They're going to be made up of things that were secreted in digestive juices or even cells that were sloughed off. That's kind of crazy, right? I know. So. Okay. Now let's talk about the fats because really there's no problem with carbohydrates and proteins. You just break them down. You break out, you know, carbohydrates break down to monosaccharides. Proteins are broken down into amino acids. And they, they all just go into the cell and then go into blood. When it comes to the lipids, you have a little bit of a tricky situation because the larger fats don't cross over that easily. So we have something called bile or bile salts. Bile salts have the ability to take the long chain fatty acids in monoglycerides and wrap them up in a package called a micelle. That micelle has the ability to cross and diffuse into the cell, whereas the fat alone couldn't do it. So if we have short chain fatty acids, no problem. They can diffuse. It's the large short chains or the long chain, long chain fatty acids and the monoglycerides that require bile salts to form a micelle that'll take it into the cell. And then once it gets in there, it forms, well, first it goes into the cell, it transforms into a triglyceride. This is the fat that we're talking about. It becomes a triglyceride, and then the triglyceride is packaged as a chylomicron, and then, guess what? It doesn't go to blood. The fat doesn't go immediately to the blood. It actually goes to a lacteal, so it goes into your lymphatic system. So that's where everything is switched up, okay? So if you can remember, your carbohydrates need to be monosaccharides. They can diffuse into the cell and then go into blood. Proteins are broken down to amino acids. They go into the cell, go into the blood. Yep, it's the lipids where we have some trouble. So the uh, long, long chain fatty acids or the monoglycerides are the ones that will be coated with bile salts, become micelles, go into the cell. 
then transformed into triglycerides, packaged as a chylomicron, then they go into lacteals, not your bloodstream. Okay. Does everyone understand that? Yes? Okay. Cool. So, at the level of the small intestine, I am absorbing monosaccharides and amino acids into the bloodstream. I am not absorbing any of my lipids. My lipids will all, no matter how they get there, they all go to my lacteal. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the tiny ones, very, very tiny ones, yeah. But the long, the long ones and the monoglycerides are gonna have to go through the route of eventually becoming a chylomicron. And they do that with bile. That's what aids them in doing that. Yes. Okay. And here on this chart too, it kind of, it illustrates it for you here in green. This green vessel is a lacteal, that's the lymphatic system, and these are your chylomicrons that are coming out containing those long chain fatty acids. And then in the red here, this is uh, the capillary system that continues with your venules. This is where you've got your um, sugars, your proteins, or your amino acids, your monosaccharides, um, and then just the small chain fatty acids that can pass through there. Those will go to your heart on the right side and then eventually be on the arterial side. And then the lymphatics will travel through the lymphatic and eventually dump into that um, venous side also. And then what about other stuff? Things like electrolytes and vitamins and water. Well, we're gonna absorb our electrolytes at the small intestine by active transport. We're gonna absorb the fat soluble vitamins by simple diffusion in my cells. We're gonna absorb the water soluble by simple diffusion because it's water soluble, it crosses that membrane pretty easily. We don't have to worry about packaging them or disguising them in anything. And then all of our water is absorbed by osmosis. Make sense? All right. Large intestine. Wow. My whole day is just zooming by. <laughs> it goes so quick. Okay. So, obviously, the small intestine had the big job, right? What does the large intestine do? Well, there's not that much of the large intestine, first of all. It does begin uh, right here with the cecum. That's the first part. Remember, the ileum was the last part of your small intestine. The ileum dumps into the cecum. There is a valve here, the ileocecal valve, and that valve will remain closed until it's time to empty into the cecum. Um, once it's, uh, this uh, leftovers of all that digestion happens, once that enters into the cecum, it's going to travel up through the ascending colon, over through the transverse colon, um, back down through the descending colon, and then eventually make it down through the rectum and then out of the body through the anus. Oh. Now, so we have a control valve right here called the ileocecal valve. There's also a control right here at the exit, and it is a sphincter, and it has two parts to it. So we have an internal anal sphincter um, over here on the inside. And the way the internal anal, anal sphincter works is all of this digested waste product keeps moving, moving, moving. Once it gets here, pushing that wall out by packing the waste material in it will actually stimulate the internal sphincter to open up. Once the internal sphincter opens up, you feel that. You'll be aware of it. You'll feel the urge. And that's when you have the ability to open the external sphincter voluntarily, okay? So the two anal sphincters, the internal is involuntary, the external is voluntary. That's the one where you can hold it until you find an appropriate time and place 
and then you can release the external anal sphincter. So um, that's the basic anatomy of the colon. I do want to mention one thing right here is an appendix. We didn't see any appendix appendices because cats don't have an appendix. Um, but that is a little patch of lymphatic tissue that we have at the colon. All right, histologically, yes. So your colon actually has a lot of bacteria, resident bacteria that lives in it. Um, and the appendix is just sort of like a last checkpoint. Um, you wanna make sure you have your bacterial flora, the good bacteria that you want to keep healthy and alive and that it's not overtaken by bad bacteria. So if you have bacteria coming in from the outside, um, something that's not normally supposed to be in your body, um, it can kill off your good bacteria. So your appendix is like a little police station just to make, you know, keep everyone in check. If something's wrong, it can alert the um, lymphatic system to um, kick it in gear and make it attack the bad bacteria. So it acts exactly the same as your tonsils would in your mouth but it's at the exit. You got tonsils at the entrance of everything coming in. You have your appendix at the exit of everything leaving. Make sense? Even though both, both of those get removed at some point in your life. Mm -hmm. You're gonna answer your own question. Go for it. Yes. Even though they, most, most people have their tonsils removed, a lot of people have their appendix removed. Right. You're the like, so, uh-huh. So anytime you ingest anything that has a bacteria in it or are exposed to it, your system can be exposed to it in any way. Like right now, I have a, uh, most definitely have some type of bacterial infection going on because of, I told you I had yellow and green boogers and stuff, right? So inadvertently, I'm definitely swallowing some of that. It's pus, but it's not really boogers, it's pus, but I'm swallowing it it's gonna end up in my system somehow, whether it gets through there or through bloodstream or whatever, through my lymphatics, any bacteria flowing through your body, whether you ate it or drank it or were exposed to it, you breathed it in somehow, um, that appendix will act the same as any other lymphatic tissue in your body. Wait, sorry, say that again, because I can't hear that, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that healthy stock of bacteria that we need to have, the whole idea of probiotics is bacteria. Right? Probiotics are bacteria. The appendix? Yes. So look at where it's at. No, no, no. So the appendix right here is like any other lymphatic tissue, like all of your lymph nodes, right? Your tonsils, everything. What happens when your tonsils get inflamed? What happens when any, any lymphatic tissue, when, when it's exposed to bacteria, it can inflame and enlarge, right? Most of the time the tonsils are okay because as long as they don't close up the opening to your mouth, no big deal. It's if, if it's a lymph no, node, I mean, if it's down here, it's not really bothering anything if, if it enlarges, right? Look at the appendix. The opening to the appendix, I want you to see how big this is. Do you see this opening right here? It's a tiny little opening. So when that appendix becomes inflamed, the likelihood of this being closed off <coughs> is pretty high because it's a very small opening. So if it inflames and it closes off that opening, now you have bacteria trapped inside with this lymphatic tissue. And the likelihood of pus oozing out and having nowhere to go is a problem. And that's why most people have their appendix removed. Because if you have an appendix and it bursts inside of the abdomen, you are going to have a mess. You're gonna have bacteria and pus all over the place. Now you're talking about septic shock and dying, right? So that's why 
number one, why it's easily impacted because it's, it's not very big and the opening is not very big to be able to flush anything out. Right, it can be obstructed pretty easily. Number two, it's under pressure, so it's super painful. And number three, the likelihood of it rupturing is pretty high and dangerous if it does. So you take it out the minute you know that something's going on in it. You don't want to risk infecting everything in your abdomen, right? But in reality, the appendix acts just like any other lymphatic tissue in your body. Now, why can we remove the tonsils and remove your appendix and be totally normal? Because that's not the only location of lymphatic tissue. Remember, we just went through Peyer's patches for days in the intestines, right? We've got lymphatic patches all over the place in our body, in different areas, especially in our gut. And so removing the appendix is not a big deal. And then ask me, well, why do we have it? Because that's one question I cannot answer. And I've read a lot of studies, and I think it's like some type of remnant, but then that takes us into evolution. Um, so, <laughs> but I don't want to talk about evolution in anatomy, but it, it may very well be a remnant of something that has evolved and that we found that we no longer need. And so it, it slowly, um, you know, changes just like you know, how our anatomy is changing and everything else changes from generation to generation. Yeah, but that's super cool, super important. Did that answer everyone's question on the appendix? No, that is, that is what I call real life anatomy. That's the kind of stuff that you want to remember because when you're in that situation, you just made yourself look a thousand times smarter in front of all your friends because you've been <laughs> for real. <laughs> and appendicitis is like the number one suspect for acute abdomen. Acute abdomen is when you get a patient that's in so much pain, you can't even touch their stomach. It's so bad, right? So there's a little bit of more information. So, and then also it is very high on the rebound. Like if you have somebody just beginning to have appendicitis and you push down on that, uh, where the appendix is, which would be the lower uh, right quadrant, and then you can push down, they'll be okay with you pushing down, but you let go and they're in excruciating pain, right? Oh. Now you know. <laughs> and the whole point of this large intestine really Remember, 90% of everything that's happening is happening in the small intestine. The large intestine takes the waste products that we didn't digest. It um, packs it all up, sort of like the trash collector. There'll be a little bit of absorption of water. There'll, there will be some vitamins that are absorbed. All of the digestion that's happening in the intestines is only like 10%, but what does happen is done by bacteria. That's the job of that bacteria, is to break down whatever's left and help us um, make a few vitamins even in the process. Okay, so microscopically, histologically, in the colon, there's not a lot going on. You have absorptive cells that will absorb some of that water, and you have goblet cells that are gonna secrete mucus. No big deal, right? Because we're just focusing on getting what remaining water we need and then letting the bacteria do its job by fermenting whatever's left um, to create some vitamins for us. And then just a little reminder here, there are no circular folds or villi in the colon, okay? There's, no, there's not much absorption ha happening in the large intestine. Okay, so functions. We've got movement, and it comes in the form of hostile turning, peristalsis, even mass peristalsis, but the whole point of it is to move all of this waste to the very end of the road so we can empty it out of the body. We do have bacteria in the colon and they play a huge role in breaking down um, whatever's left over of those amino acids and producing the vitamins. We will absorb whatever's remaining, that 10% of water that needs to be absorbed along with some ions and the vitamins that we formed in the colon, it is going to form feces. What is feces? Stool, what is stool? Poop, okay? Formation of poop, and then 
Defecation is the elimination of poop or elimination of feces. Let's just make it scientific. The, I can't even spell it. Elimination of feces from the body. All right. So that's really all the colon does. It just harbors a bunch of bacteria that ferments a little bit, produces some vitamins, absorbs a little bit of leftover water that we need, and gives you poop. So movement-wise, the three types of movements we're going to see are hostile churning, peristalsis, and then mass peristalsis. Hostile churning is really whenever you... Uh, Stuff starts to come in and it starts to pack, the walls will contract and push it down further. Peristalsis is that same worm like movement that we saw in the rest of the GI tract. Mass peristalsis is going to be in preparation for elimination. That is when everyone's uh, contracting. Elim Struggles of a bad speller. How do I do it? I don't know. Okay. You can read this word, right? Elim you can tell that it says elimination. Okay. All right. So that is my mechanical. Chemically, what's happening? It's all bacterial. There are no enzymes in the colon, no enzymes secreted from the large intestine. So we're going to break down whatever's left by bacteria and we're going to produce some vitamins like vitamin B and K. All of it's done by bacteria. So you should immediately think colon, bacteria. Whatever's done is done by bacteria. Okay, absorption. We're going to absorb whatever's left of water, that 10% that's remaining that our body needs, along with those vitamins and some electrolytes. That's it. And then feces. What is poop? It's a lot of water, actually. Water, inorganic salts, a lot of it is sloughed <laughs> off epithelial cells, bacteria, products of bacterial um, decomposition, undigested portions of food, things like fiber we cannot digest. Uh, cellulose we cannot digest, so corn. <laughs> there are, there's a lot of things. If our body can't break it down, all those fibers and things, we can't break it down into basic um, amino acids or monosaccharides or triglycerides, we can't absorb it into our bloodstream. So if it can't be absorbed, it's going to be feces. Huh? You know, <laughs> I, th I thought about that just yesterday, as a matter of fact, because I got home, there's, there's real, no real nutritional value in it, let's just say that, because um, I love corn, and I got home last night, it was late, and I was tired, I'm like, man, I just opened up a can of corn, I'm like, why do we even eat corn? You all want to hear something? Okay, way back in the day, I had an au pair when my kids were like really, really young, and she was from France, like this young 18-year-old. Um, French college student um, that came to live with us for like a few months and the first time we had a barbecue and there was corn I cannot tell you what she did because she looked at us like we were insane and I was like what you don't, you don't like corn I'm like corn's good you don't like it and she was like uh no we feed that to the chickens people don't eat corn she's like it's not people are not supposed to eat corn it's only for chickens yeah she refused to touch the corn because that was just for the chickens. So, I don't know, maybe we're, maybe it's true, I don't know why. But everything's here for a reason, right? And it tastes good. So, well, no, we don't, we can't digest corn. So, we were talking about this the other day and somebody said, yeah, you can basically tell what's undigestible. Whatever comes out exactly the same way as it went in. But that's not always true because sometimes you may be ill, you may have something that's making this movement go too fast through your GIT and it doesn't have a chance to be digested. So sometimes we have undigested food that passes simply because the time that it needed 
in the intestines or in the stomach was not long enough for it to be broken down. Okay, uh, just a quick look at our fluid balance on the, uh, that's left. on the left side over here is everything that we take in or produce. Basically everything that travels through your GIT. You've got a liter of saliva, you have two liters you drank, two liters from your stomach being produced as gastric juice, one liter of bile being produced by your liver, uh, two liters as pancreatic juice coming from the pancreas, one liter of intestinal juice coming from the small intestines. That should total about nine liters traveling through this GIT. What do we take back into our bloodstream? We will take from the small intestine absorption of about eight liters and about one liter from the large intestine, giving you a total of nine liters. I didn't put this up here because I want you to memorize the numbers. No. I put this up here because I want you to realize that the idea of everything we take in or produce at the end of the day pretty much equals what we put back into our body. So when you talk about recycling, our bodies recycle more than anything on the planet. Everything, I mean, even the gastric juice that we are producing in our stomach is going to be absorbed again in the form of water and then come back again as gastric juice. I know. Super cool. But anyways, that's the whole balance of homeostasis is the idea is that, you know, you take in um, what you put out and you keep it that way so you can stay level. Okay. Um, so this is a defecation reflex that is pooping. It's not really important, but we can talk about it. So once that waste products are packed into the rectum, that is going to stretch the walls, you have receptors that will fire an impulse, go to your spinal cord, come back with a motor neuron, tell that um, internal sphincter to relax, and then you're also going to have the urge at the same time or notification that that's going on. Then you can go in and open the external sphincter. Simple, basic. Uh, do I need to stop? Yes, we're on time. Okay, so we'll pick it up from the pancreas. We have the pancreas and the liver left. There's not too much left in here. Pancreas, liver, and gallbladder is like a few slides. We'll do those, what is today, Tuesday? We'll do those on Thursday, and then we'll go ahead and start with the kidney on Thursday too. Y'all enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you on Thursday. Judge, you're coming. Talk about it. Oh, man, Alyssa, I need you to... Um, I need, when you guys start asking stuff, to ask it out loud so you can actually hear me. I mean, so I can hear you because I don't see the chats when I'm teaching. 